Well, we're continuing this morning with our study in Joshua. We're at chapter 9 of Joshua. And I've often said that the book of Joshua is, is probably the most spiritual book that I've read in terms of people and events and things being representative of something else. Of course, we, we've said so many times, it's history. It's, it's a real historical event. This really happened in exactly the way that Scripture lays it out. But as we read in, uh, it's in, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 10, and then also in Romans, maybe 15. But it, anyway, it talks about these things were preserved for us. They were written down and preserved for our understanding, for examples for us. They, again, they were real stories and real events, but the, the pictures that they portray. We've also often said that we know that everything that happened day in and day out was not written down. So therefore, the things that were preserved, the things that were kept, were kept for a reason, for us to learn from them. We'll see this uh, even more, of course, when we come to the, the book of Ephesians. But, but this book represents a lot of things for us. We, we look at the big picture. Joe and I were talking the other day, and, and we, we have, or at least I do, have this really bad tendency to want to get down to the, the details and what's the words mean and what's this and what's that. And, and sometimes you just got to back out and look at, as they say, the, the 10,000 foot view or the bird's eye view. What's the overall picture? When you look at the overall picture, then you begin to see patterns and you begin to see how things play out in, in, in connection with each other. But in this study, in, in this lesson, along with the battles of Josh, or Jericho and Ai, this battle that they will face this week represents three worldly enemies in our lives. I, I, once, uh, I once heard Evelyn Laycock say that there are only three kinds of sin in the world. And, and you think of the world and you think of, of the amount of evil that's in this world and it can be boiled down into three sins. There's only three sins or three types of sins. And these come from uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. And in that we read, John says, Do not love the world. Now, of course, that doesn't mean... Like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That means the people of the world. When he says here in 1 John 2, when he says, do not love the world, that means the world system. Don't love the world system. Nor the things in the world system. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world, and here you go, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are not from the Father. They are of the world. If you, if you study Scripture, you'll see those three things keep popping up all throughout Scripture. I mean, we could go on and on and on with those three things as, you, as they, they show up in Scripture. But just a couple of them. We see it, first of all, manifested in Genesis 3. The, I mean, in the very first fall, the very first sin, Eve looked at the tree. She saw that it was good for food, it was pleasing to the eyes, and it was desired to make wise. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And it says she took of its fruit and she ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. We see those three things show up in the three temptations that Christ faced in the wilderness. He was tempted to turn the stones into, into bread. He was tempted to, to tempt God's protection by jumping off the temple and finally to bow down and worship Satan. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. We saw it back in chapter 7 in Achan's actions when he finally said of those, of those things in Jericho, he said, I saw it, I wanted it, and I took it. Those three things. We see it in these three, in this, in this lesson, these three things. Jericho represented that, that worldly battle that we face, that we have no idea how to deal with. It's something entirely new. How in the world am I going to whatever, fill in the blank? Jericho is the worldly enemy. AI 
was a picture of that, that problem that we sometimes feel is too minor to bother God with. That That's a fleshly enemy where you and I say, I can do it myself. Don't need God, I'll just do it myself. It's the fleshly enemy. So we have the worldly enemy and the fleshly enemy. And this week we'll meet a third enemy. This third enemy is sneaky. And he's devious. And he deceives. And, and I have down here, who is that? It is Satan. But it, of course Satan is behind all of this. But Satan is that enemy that is that angel of light, as Paul talks about. It looks good. It looks like scripture. It looks like it's what I need to be doing. It's the uh, the uh, the sparkly jangle, you know, the, the pretty things that we go after. Devious and deceptive. So that's what we'll look at today. But let's begin with prayer. Father, as we, as we dig into this, may we be ever mindful of the truth of scripture. That this is your word. As we talked earlier this morning, I just we, we get so overwhelmed sometimes with it. I I, I settle down to read and I, and I just I I don't know enough. I just I just there's more I need to know. But we also know, Father, that you have given us your word. That we only we come to it where we are. We study it, we read it where we are, and then you take us deeper into this word. We, we cannot just put it aside because we don't understand it all. It is your word. And we pray, Father, as we, as we gather here on Sunday mornings, as, as we study together, may we be ever filled with understanding of your word. May, may the light bulbs go off. May, may what we read connect with something else that we've read, but, but they will not connect if we don't spend time reading. So I pray, Father, that you will give us a, a desire to read more. And then, Father, you connect it. May the Holy Spirit within us connect these dots as we read Scripture. And may we learn to see your hand in them, and your hand not only in the Scriptures, but your hand in directing our lives so again, we thank you for Scripture, and we pray that we may learn from you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the historical setting for our study, and because it's real, it has, it has a historical setting. It's a real place. And if you, uh, if you take time to, to pull out your map later, you can see that Joshua actually had a strategy. We're not really given this strategy. You have to kind of, again, step back and look at, at the map and see what he did, and then you know what the strategy was. And that is that it, to take Jericho first. God told him because where they went across the Jordan River, there was Jericho. That was the first place they were to take. Well, Jericho was kind of in the middle where they went across the Jordan River. It was right there in front of them. And if you look at Jericho, then you look at North is Ai, and to the south is uh, is the Gibeon area, and so he had this um, uh, this, this sort of a battle plan to first take Ai to the northeast, and then to turn his attention to the southern part. Now, Scripture Joshua here does not tell us that he sent spies into the southern area, but we can we can guess that he did. He sent spies into Jericho. He sent spies into Ai. So the common sense would tell us that he also sent spies into the southern area. And, and I think we'll see that in a few minutes, that that's exactly what he did. But if we look first at all at, at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9, we see that for the first time we start seeing the enemy making plans. The It's called the tribal leaders or the kings, as the King James puts it. They, they decide to band together. And to come against Joshua and the Israelites. So verses 1 and 2. Now it came about when all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland and on the coast of the Great Sea, that's the Mediterranean Sea, toward Lebanon. And if you look at that on the map, you see all those areas together. And they were given the tribal names, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. When they heard of it, I don't know exactly what it is, but when they heard of it, they gathered themselves together with one accord, with one mind. We need to fight against these Israelites, to fight against with Joshua and against Israel. 
So as I said, we're not exactly sure what it is, whether it was the, uh, the, the blessings and the cursings that we read at the end of chapter 8, where you know the other people could hear it when you had part of the, of the uh, children of Israel on one mountain and part on the other mountain, and they were calling out these blessings and these curses that, that uh, Moses had told them. You know that word got around, or was the it the battle of Jericho and then the battle of Ai? We don't know exactly what it was, but they heard of it, and maybe a little bit of both, and that caused them to gather together. We're going to have to do something. So they, they gathered together. Now, we don't have evidence that these kings ever actually did in mass attack uh, Israel. But we there is archaeological evidence that they sent letters to Egypt to try to bring in reinforcements to fight against it. Uh, they it said that they, uh, they were called the Hebrea, which most scholars believe refer to the Hebrews, come and join with us to fight against these, these uh, Israelites. But Egypt at that time was in a very weakened state. Well, what, what would cause them to be in such a weakened state? Well, 40 years earlier, they lost their entire army in the Red Sea. Remember that? So they were very weak at that time in history. World history will tell you about them being weakened. The Bible tells us why they were weakened. But anyway, they, they didn't get any help. And so these Gibeonites, these from Gibeah, who were part of the Hivite tribe, they decide we're not going to join in with them. They're not doing any good. They're not getting any battle plans together. They're just talk. They're all talk. We'll, t- we'll, we'll make our own plans. We'll take matters into our own hands. So what did they do? Look at verses 3 through 6. When the inhabitants of Gibeon, now this is less than 20 miles away. Now keep that in mind, less than 20 miles away of where the Israelites are camped. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard that what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they also acted craftily. Your Bible may say that they, they planned a plan or they were devious. So they set out as envoys. And look at what they did. They took worn out sacks on their donkeys and wineskins and worn out and torn and mended and worn out and patched sandals on their feet and worn out clothes on themselves. And they took all this old crusty, dry, crumbly bread with them. Verse 6, And they went to Joshua at his camp at Gilgal, and they said to him and to the men of Israel, primarily the leadership, Oh, we've come from a far country. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us. So what do you think about their plan? I mean, that sounds like a, sounds like a good plan, a devious plan. If you, you have to admit that, that the lengths that they went to to deceive the Israelites was pretty ingenious. I mean, they're less than 20 miles away. But they make it look like, oh, we've traveled years you know, to get to where you are. So you see, just like us, Joshua keeps facing these challenges that he's never faced before. He's never dealt with somebody that tried trickery on him before. He had never faced a walled city before. Well, they got through that. They'd never been defeated before. Well, God led them through that. And so now they've got a brand new experience. And and they've never faced somebody that, that came to them and said, Oh, we just want to submit to you. We just, we just want to start, please, please don't attack us. They'd only known war of some kind or another. And when you've only known war or you've only known difficulties, when something seemingly easy comes along, you don't quite know how to deal with it. It's a brand new experience. It took them by surprise. And, and the thing I think that really defeated Joshua and the leaders was flattery. I mean, you know the old saying, flattery will get you everywhere. So, we're your servants, they said. Look at verses 7 through 11. So, so they, the men of Israel said to these Hivites, to these, to these, uh, from Gibeon, uh, hmm, maybe, maybe you're, maybe you live within our land. How shall we make a covenant with you? We're not supposed to make a covenant with anybody here. 
Oh no, they said in verse 8, we, we're your servants. And so Joshua said to them, well, who are you and where are you from? And they said, oh, you can imagine. Oh, we've come a long way just laying it on thick. We, we, we heard about the fame of the Lord your God. and we, we heard about the report of him and all that he did in Egypt. We heard about all he did to the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan. Sihon, king of the Heshbon, Og, the king of Bashan. So, so our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us and they said, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go and meet them and say to them, we will be your servants and please make a covenant with us. I mean, they're just laying it on thick. Flattery is a serious weapon of the enemy. And that's one we don't... I mean, we're kind of on the guard against people who are things that come against us. But when they seem to be on our own side, or they seem to be very loving, innocuous, you know, harmless, we're taken, we're taken off, off guard. Flattery is a serious enemy or a serious weapon of the enemy. There, there are many examples of this in the Bible, but, but uh, one that really I always think of when I think of flattery always comes to mind. And that's the story that I've always wanted to title A Tale of Two Letters. It's a story of Hezekiah. And this is found in, uh, in 1 Kings 19. Hezekiah, you, you, you may not remember the name Hezekiah, but everybody knows the song. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. There's a verse in there that says there once was a king named Hezekiah who didn't want to die. That's this Hezekiah. Hezekiah was very, very sick. And, well, let me, let me back up. Before that, when the northern kingdom went into captivity by the Assyrians, Assyria sent a leader down to Judah and said to Hezekiah, who was a king, we're going to overtake you. We're going to defeat you just like we did Samaria. Well, what's the first thing that Hezekiah did? He took that letter and he went to the temple and he spread it out in the temple and he prayed. He went to his knees. First, he had an enemy that he knew was an enemy and he prayed. That's what we do when we have an enemy that we know is an enemy, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's an actual physical enemy, whether it's health run. First thing we do is pray. We're on it with that. So he took the letter and he fell down before the Lord and he prayed and the Assyrians were defeated. They did not take over Judah. Then a few years later, Hezekiah was very sick. And Isaiah told him that he was. the Lord said he was going to die and he prayed and he prayed to live. Well, God relented and God gave him 15 more years. Well, after he got over that illness, he received another letter. This time the letter was from the leaders of Babylon. This is before Babylon became a great nation. They were very, very weak. They were very, very small. And they said, oh, we just want to come. We want to praise you. We want to praise your God because he's done this for you. Well, Hezekiah's like, sure, come on. I'll tell you all about my God. So they come in and, and they laid it on thick. Oh, we just want to worship your God. So Hezekiah takes him to the temple. Shows them all the storehouses of the temple where all the gold is, where all the armor is, where all the jewels are, where everything, all of their wealth was. Showed them everything. Showed them how fortified the city was. See these great walls? Well, you know, this may be a weak place. Showed them everything because he was so full of pride. In a few years then, they knew exactly where to attack. They knew exactly where to come back and get all the jewels, all the gold, all the treasures of the temple. He, they knew where they were hidden because Hezekiah had told them he had been manipulated, he had been flattered, and he, in his pride, showed them all of that. We, we must be spiritually discerning because there are manipulative people and there are liars and they know no bounds. He took the first letter to the temple, but the second letter he kept in his pride. And so we come back to Joshua. The elders of Joshua's time were flattered as well, and it cost them greatly too. In verses 12 and 13, we see that, that they go on, the Gibeonites, and they say, oh, look at our bread. This bread was warm when we left home, and look at it now. It's old, and it's crusty, and it's molded. 
We took it for our, our provisions. And on the day that we left, it was warm. And when we come to you, and now look at it. It's old and dry and crumbled. Look at these wineskins. They were new when we left home. And now look at them. They're torn. Look at our clothes. Look at our sandals. They're worn out. But Oh, we've been on a long journey. And so they laid it on thick. And if you'll notice, it was... We talked about this a little bit in our Sunday school this morning and talked about giving way too much information. They, they were, they were a- answering questions they weren't even asked. You be, be aware of somebody just giving you way too much information. We said, me thinks I just protest too much. They were ask, answering every question or objection the Israelites, before they even thought of the question, they were answering the question. Beware of people who give way too much information. But then verse 14 is our key verse. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. They did not ask God about it. They did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. Now you would think that Joshua would have learned his lesson. After that battle of Jericho, when he sent men to spy out Ai without God's direction... But but every situation is different. We have to always be on our guard. Look at how these two situations are different. The, the rush to act without God's direction after the Battle of Jericho likely came because of Joshua's pride. Remember, his fame spread through all the land. We've got to be doing what's right. We've got to be doing God's will. Let us just continue to go on. And they didn't ask God. But now here it's different. It, that, was, that was emotion and that was adrenaline and that was pride. Now, the rush to act without God's direction seems to come from veiled flattery. They they appealed to their pride. Gave them great flattery. And the result, verse 15, Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them. The leaders of the congregation of Israel swore an oath to the Gibeonites saying, we will always take care of you. Now, not only did they make peace with them, they made a covenant with them to let them live. When they, when it says they swore an oath, that means they used God's name to swear this oath. May By God, may we do this for you. And so that could not be revoked. If they would, if they had gone against that covenant, it could not be made void without actually taking God's name and making God's name void. Now you and I refer to that as as taking God's name in vain. And, and, and while we're on that, it, taking God's name in vain is not simply cursing. It's not simply using God's name as a curse word. It's when we use God's name and we don't mean anything by it. That's what vain means. It means you don't mean anything by it. You don't place any value on it. If we as Christians don't live like Christians, we have taken the name of Christ upon us by being called Christians. And if we don't live that, we're taking God's name in vain. We have taken it upon us in vain. That's, that's worse than cursing. I said earlier that I thought Joshua had sent out spies, and the reason is when you, when you look at verse 16, we, we see that it, and it came about at the end of three days after they'd made this covenant. Now, now, either they had sent the spies out and they hadn't come back yet, or they didn't send the spies out until after three days after they'd made this covenant. But, but they made a covenant with them, and after three days, they heard that these were neighbors of theirs. Can, can, you, uh, can you imagine what went through their hearts? They live within 20 miles of us? Are you kidding me? They were living within their land. They heard that from the spies, either the spies that were sent out and had just come back or sent out afterward. It's like, oh, we've been had. Verses 17 through 21 tell about the Israelites then going to, to Gibeon but to check it out themselves and they find find the real story. And then the, 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 the mass of people then 
began grumbling at the leaders. You were the ones that led us astray. You were deceived. And, it, you know, it's much easier to grumble about the decisions our leaders make than to actually make them ourselves. So then in verses 22 through 23, we find, we find Joshua just making the, the best of a bad situation. As we said last week, sin can be forgiven. And, and Joshua has sinned again, and the leadership has sinned. It can be forgiven, but it always brings consequences. There are always consequences to our decisions. When the Gibeonites were pressed as to why they did this, they said in verses 24 and 25, they answered Joshua and they said, because it was certainly told your servants, we, we knew that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy the inhabitants because of the, the land before you. So we were afraid. We were afraid you would destroy us. So we came to you. That's why we did this. In verse 25, And now behold, we're in your hands. Do as it seems good and right in your sight to us. And so that's what Joshua did. Verse 26, And he did to them, this is what he did to them. He delivered them from the hands of the sons of Israel. He, he, didn't, he didn't kill them. He couldn't because they'd made an oath with God's name. He, he couldn't take their lives. And in verse 27, but Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water. In other words, made them slaves, made them servants for the congregation of Israel and for the altar of the Lord to this day, to the day that this was written, in the place in which God would choose. So here's the thing I want us to really look at. There's a difference between deception and submission and the difference between submitting and conforming. The Gibeonites chose to deceive rather than to submit. If they had come, I, I'm, this, this is my opinion on this, I believe if they had come like Rahab came and submitted to Joshua and said, we want to serve your God, I believe they, they, would have, they would have taken care of them, they would have taken them in, they would have made them part of Israel, just like Rahab was made part of Israel. But no, they chose to deceive. Uh, one writer said uh, that instead of seekers, they became sneakers. If the Canaanites, like I said, if they'd come, as, as Rahab had come, they would have been taken in. But they came with the express purpose of deceiving we know that from the way they dressed and the things they did. They came with the purpose of deceiving and not, sub not submission. Although they ultimately ended up submitting, it was not their intention to do that to start with. But I, I guess they figured cutting wood and, and hauling water was better than dying. But, but is submission enough? Is it, is it enough to just submit? Ian Bounds in his book titled Reality of Prayer says that simple submission to God's will is not the highest attitude of the soul to God. We think, if I submit to God, that's the high, that's, I'm doing the right thing. But there's more to it than just submitting. Bound says, in essence, there's a difference between submitting to God's will and conforming to His will. Conformity involves submitting. But submission, just in and of itself, may or may not uh, include conformity. You may have heard me use this illustration before. I've used it several times in several things that we've studied, but if you take two cake pans and you put water in one cake pan and you put cake batter in the other one and you put them both in the oven for, what, 350 degrees for however long it takes to bake a cake. I'm not much of a baker. But after, after however long it takes... Only the batter conforms to the shape of the pan. The water will pour right out. No matter how long it's in there, the water is going to pour right out. It has submitted to the shape of the pan for the amount of time it was in the pan. But you let it leave the pan, it'll pour right out. The cake batter conforms to the shape of the pan. Rahab and her family submitted and conformed to Jewish life. The Gibeonites first... They first decided to, to deceive rather than to submit, and then once they were caught, they had to submit, and so they decided to submit rather than to conform. They became servants, but they never conformed to Israelite life. 
However, I, I, I say that with a caveat. However, we do find, if you read on in Scripture, the Gibeonites are still in and around Israel several hundred years later because when we get to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's rebuilding the walls. We find the Gibeonites are still there and they help rebuild the walls. Maybe, maybe they eventually conform to Jewish life. We don't know that, but at least they were still there and they had been taken care of that long. They were still a part of it. So, so how do we recognize? If, if deception is the enemy, is this third enemy that we're talking about, how do we recognize this enemy and what do we do about it? Well, 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. In Ephesians 6, you're very familiar with this scripture, 11 and verses 11 and 12 says, Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. That's the great deceiver. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the worldly forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. First of all, the first step at understanding this enemy of deception is to know that there's an enemy of deception. First of all, you've got to know he's there. If Joshua and the Israelites had known that they were there, that they were from just 20 miles away, they would have been on guard for them, but they didn't know that. you got to know you got an enemy. He is a deceiver. Second of all, you have to fill yourself with God's word. You, you, so, well, what I mean, I once said to, we were when we first started our women's Bible study these twelve or so years ago. And we looked at it. And we said, "This is a big book. Where do I start? Start anywhere. Just start. Just start reading. Just read. Sometimes just just open it and read. And, and if you you like us, sometimes you just get." Just get drawn into what you're reading. If it's a narrative, it's a, if it's a story. I, I, I was looking up something in First John last week, and before I knew it, I'd read all the way through First to Second John because I just got got involved with what what John was saying. I began to see patterns in it. Just start reading. Fill yourself with God's word. And finally, the third thing: never fail to seek the counsel of the Lord. That got Joshua in trouble. That got Hezekiah in trouble. That gets us in trouble. Never seek to fail the counsel of the Lord. <laughs> Always seek God's counsel. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story. We thank you that, that it was preserved for our learning and for our understanding. And may we